Today, I would love to talk to you about a topic which uh, I'm personally uh, very passionate about, which is how we could actually use multi-agent reinforcement learning to learn more about human behavior, and in turn, use it for the benefit of the society. If I am successful today, at the end of the talk, uh, you will understand that it could be beneficial to look at multi-agent reinforcement learning from both the, perspective, from the practical and theoretical perspective as giving us more information in, for example, social sciences. Um, I also know that uh, you're quite hungry, so I'll try not to make it too long. Um, however, I'd also like to highlight that 20 minutes is not too much, so I'll try to give you a high-level overview and try to provide the motivation of why I think this is exciting and why you should be also excited. Um, so let's get started. And the first thing which I'd like to answer is, why should we care? Why is this research even important? And the reason for it is that human intelligence is something that has been crafted over years and includes thousands of years of social interactions. And I believe that through building and observing the interactions between intelligent agents, we could gain a better understanding uh, of human behavior. Um, and now we know that human intelligence in some way encapsulates social aspects. But how do we even infer it? And even if we do, how do we use it properly? Uh, to study the latter, uh, I investigate the emergence of collective behavior. I'm very interested in looking at how artificial agents go about learning to cooperate by themselves. And I do it by using multi-agent reinforcement learning. And what really drives me, what I would like to, in five years, to, let's say, learn more about is whether observing and learning more about uh, how intelligent agents interact could provide us with a better understanding of us and could be also applied to not only AI, but also to, for example, social sciences. Um, and to start off, I would like to define the notions of intelligence, which you probably were introduced like 100 times. But let me, like, just bear with me for one more time. And, uh, of course, intelligence is a, is a very tough thing to define. There is no one definition. But we could roughly maybe define it as measuring an agent's ability uh, to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. And here I would like to emphasize two points, really. The first one is that we care about something which is general. Is it something that can go about and solve a variety of tasks, then something that is optimized for one specific thing. In other words, solving a game of chess or a Go is a, is a great landmark for AI. But what we're really looking for is something which can go on and reason about what it's doing. It can go it can play chess, it can learn autonomous driving, but then it can maybe learn to deliver a, a decent speech at a, at a conference. And very interestingly, the problems, that, the types of problems which are required generality and are, are very practical are the multi-agent problems, are the multi-agent systems. And this is mainly because of the reason that in multi-agent systems, the agent is required to actively reply, to respond, to interact, and to adapt to ever-changing environments. Uh, and this is only one of the reasons of why we should be excited about multi-agent systems and uh, why the researchers are actually uh, trying to learn more about this. Uh, but there are many other. The first thing is that if we look around, almost all of these systems around us are multi-agent. Starting from family to government, traffic, market, all of them are multi-agent. We should actually understand that humans are inherently social animals. And therefore, if this is the case, an agent has to reason and has to account for the actions of other agents in an environment in order to succeed. The second thing is purely practical. A multi-agent design provides robustness, usually flexibility and scalability. And uh, the third argument, which for me personally oh, is very exciting, is that human intelligence did not evolve in isolation. This is something we know already, but we don't usually realize. We like to think of intelligence as something which simply arouses from our minds, as something, a product of our thoughts alone, something we were born with thousands of years ago, and just stayed the same. But the truth is that it, it is a result of cumulative cultural evolution. It took thousands of years, and it's still taking shape. If that's the case, why should it be even possible to create more general AI 
in the single agent framework. Um, now we know why is it important to actually study the multi-agent systems. Um, and for the rest of the time, I'd like to focus on one specific aspect, which is getting agents to cooperate with each other. And how we study AI, and how we study the cooperation in AI, uh, is usually the notion of social dilemmas. And of course, you probably all know that even getting people to cooperate is quite tough. And with agents, it's very often even harder. And uh, here, what we do is we use notions of shared dilemmas, which might sound as a social science mumbo jumbo, but really what is it is, it's something which we encounter every day. It's something which exposes um, individual and collective rationality, the tension between them. And the example of it is, let's say, free riding, uh, voter turnout, public goods. And all these situations are situations when one may be selfish, and for example, not pay for the ticket on public transport, do not go to vote. But if we all decide to do this, then the result for the whole group will be disastrous. And uh, why, is, why are we even studying it? Simply because if we are to deploy an agent in a society along humans, and if this agent is given some, let's say, decision-making, this agent needs to have an idea of what is collective rationality and needs to take it into account. And how we infer it, that's, of course, a big problem. A social dilemma which I would like to focus on is the tragedy of the commons, which is a social dilemma which deals with common shared resources. And uh, to try to explain to you how it works, I would love to give a, a comparison, a metaphor with uh, global warming, where in global warming, the climate, the environment, is the common good, which is shared along all of us, and uh, our goal is to prevent it, to prevent the research depletion, to prevent climate change. And in order to achieve it, we all need to cooperate. We all need to stop acting selfishly. We need to maybe sometimes take a bro broccoli instead of this juicy piece of beef, or take a train instead of a plane. Uh, this is the only way we can really somehow get closer to achieving and to achieving, to, to achieving our goal. And that's why I decided to study it. But getting back to the problem, um, but even the main question is, I'm interested in studying, despite all these obstacles, how can cooperation emerge and be stable? And emerge is crucial here, meaning that we do not fix anything in the agents. We do not tell them to cooperate. There are no ethical statesmen there. We want to see how they go about learning it. And uh, how, how we study is, how we study it, because this problem is actually very, very old, and it has been studied for years in mathematics, game theory, and many, many more. Uh, but what is new is actually what we can use it, our methods. And for the methods, we use a deep reinforcement learning algorithm, which is actually, let's say, quite basic. This is a DQN, you probably all heard of it, uh, because of, for example, Atari. Um, and here I've used it because there is, you could, let's say, roughly interpret it as a, as a good model of human decision-making, meaning that it's of policy, uh, it has some notion of memory through experience replay, uh, it also, let's say, is quite stable because of the target network, and very, very importantly, it has multiple improvements and it tested on various tasks, which was important for me because what I wanted to test is I wanted to see how it goes about solving a new task, which it hasn't been yet exposed to. And here, I do not care about how it does with uh, you know, Atari, where the score is the only thing. I really care about how they go about getting the rewards. And having, let's say, the ability to benchmark it, to look at the improvements, look at how different improvements affect the result, was very, very important. But DQN also has many limitations. And one of it is actually the fact that it's a decentralized training, decentralized execution algorithm, meaning all the training is local, all the, in, on, on the test time, the execution is also local, the training is individual, and importantly, uh, this is a significant limitation. The agents regard other agents as simply part of the environment. And this is nowhere close to what we humans do, because when I look at the person, at anybody in the room, I can already see you're a human, and immediately, automatically, I create a model of you, of your potential behavior, and this really allows me to explicit reason about what you can do. And I do the same when I look at a, a, a cat, a dog. 
the models are different, but the point is that I can explicitly reason about it. DQN does not do it. Um, I'm going to talk about it slightly later on, about how we could actually fix it, but getting back to the strategy of the commons, what we're interested in doing is we're interested in deploying agents using DQN, each, of course, a different one, an individual, individual one, deploying in a, in a game that is supposed to mimic the strategy of the commons problem. So we mimic the human decision-making with DQN, and we mimic the problem, the game, the strategy of the commons problem, with a specific environment, a game, that we deploy the agents in. Uh, so let's actually look at experiments. Before I wanted to, let's say, test the multi-agent, I looked at the, uh, at the single agent um, case, and what is really important here is that these red, uh, these red squares are the agents, and these green squares are the apples, and the agent wants to collect as many apples as he can. But the problem is that the regrowth of these apples, where one square is one apple, depends on the uh, number of the uncollected apples around it, meaning if the agent was to go here, collect all of this in this area, they would not regrow, because there are no apples around it. But if it collects, as it does here, only three of them, then they have time to regrow. So the agent has to find like a sustainable way to collect it. And in both single agent scenarios, in MAP1 and MAP2, this was quite easy. They solved it quite quickly. You can see that this is like an optimal strategy where the agent just goes around and collects it all the time. Um, but the cool thing was the multi-agent case, where the agent had to actually learn to cooperate, uh, learn to prevent from resource depletion, and the trick here was that they, they could also fight, meaning that they could actually freeze each other, the laser beam, which is just this white thing you can see. Um, this actually was a very important thing because this gives the ability to penalize other agents, meaning, for example, what we, I could see is that if one agent is depleting the, is taking too, much, too many apples, other agents actually freeze him with the, with the beam. They can penalize him for it. Uh, however, even in this case, uh, the agents were successful. Uh, given some time, they were able to, let's say, solve it and find a sustainable way to do it. And importantly, they were, able, they were actually able to cooperate, meaning that they were able to split these sectors and they were able to go into all in different sectors and, uh, m and, and find a way to sustainably manage it. And uh, to look at the results slightly, here we can, for example, see the graphs. And here you can see a not really nice thing, which is this dip. This dip means that at some point, the agents started to fight a lot and collecting apples a lot, a lot. And this was very bad. So then they realized that they need to bounce back and became sustainable. Um, however, in real life, you know, like we would probably be here and we would manage to like deplete whole resources and we'd be doomed. So that's not so good, maybe. Anyway, lessons learned. First is that agents with actually very limited cognitive capabilities are capable of cooperation in resource management problem. And this is actually quite important because uh, when we, for example, speak to somebody who is doing, let's say, research in social science about it, this is usually seen as something quite, quite specific for humans, quite complex. So this was actually quite exciting. But even what was more important, more exciting for me personally, is that it opened avenue for further research. And this includes social sciences, where we can, for example, allow for monitoring how different game parameters influence the outcome. So, for example, we can change the, we can change the way agents penalize each other or increase the penalty for, for uh, freezing each other. And this means that we can see how this influences the outcome. And maybe in the, picture, in the big picture, someday, uh, we'll be able to incorporate it in, let's say, a treaty. And we'll be able to see, OK, maybe increasing the observability of the agents can actually have a positive influence. So maybe we'll try to give a, let's say, include observation of all the agents to uh, make the cooperation more stable. And for AI, what was, for example, for reinforcement link specifically action at AI, as for me, what was really interesting from a perspective of somebody who did a lot of like, single-age reinforcement learning, is this really showed way more information, such as inequality, peacefulness, and really uncovered more information about the algorithm 
itself. And if we, for example, to give an algorithm, then the outcome might be the same. But how they go about doing it is quite different, actually. Um, but now, I'd actually love to talk about, slide about, about something which I've mentioned about the DQN, which is the significant limitation of the DQN not being able to reason explicitly about uh, other agents' actions. And this is really important because, firstly, this allows us for way more stable and way more reliable cooperation. If the agent is able to see and is able to create a model of the other agents, you can see that the, that, that the agents also wants to cooperate, that to actually maximize the rewards, we need to cooperate, then this becomes way, way, way easier. And can we do it? The answer is actually yes. And this is very, very novel, meaning in the last two years, there were algorithms who, let's say, specialize in this area. One of them is LOLA, which stands for Learning with Opponent Learning Awareness. And this is an opponent modeling, met open modeling method. And let's say, in short, what it does is that it allows to account for the actions um, of the other agents. Meaning that in its value function, it incorporates, let's say, the action, of the, of the, of the, the action which the other agent is trying to take. So as one agent, before taking an action, it tries to shape, it tries to influence uh, the action of other agents. It tries to, let's say, influence other agents to do more what he wants them to do. And uh, this has been really successful in some of the simple game theory cooperative games, game theory games. This sounds maybe not so cool, but in reality, it is. Simply because all of the single agent RL was failing at it badly. PPO, AC3, many, many, many other, they were all failing at these kind of games. However, um, the drawback is that it was very memory, memory and computer intensive. And I think we all know if, if something is memory and computer intensive, we can, at least for now, throw it in the bin. But can we do better? And uh, yes, we can. And we can do it with the algorithm called MADDPG, which is, let's say, an extension of uh, deep deter deterministic policy gradient uh, to the multi-agent scenario. And what is interesting is that it's centralized training, the centralized execution. And this, I think, is also very exciting for, let's say, the practical applications, simply because um, there is a phase in training where all the agents have access to other observations, and they can actually try to learn not only from their actions, but also from other actions, or, or the actions of other agents. And uh, the second point, is, and of course, this is decoupled in the test time. So the test time, the agents do not have access to other observations, and they have to actually, let's say, be more uh, individual. They're, let's say, more isola isolated. The second thing is that there's an actor critic architecture, which you might heard of, might have heard of. Um, and this literally includes, apart from an actor, also a critic. A critic which is trying to guide the agent into an optimal policy. And here, the critic was the the critic was actually the type, the, the, the part in the algorithm which is supposed to take the actions of other agents uh, and then try to guide the, its personal agent to, act, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to a sustainable or a, a cooperative or just or the optimal policy because it actually doesn't have to be uh, cooperative at all. And a uh, few, let's say, remarks I would like to make is that I was speaking about cooperation. These algorithms mainly were tested in cooperation. However, they could be also applied to competition. Meaning, if you, for example, applied, let's say, Lola to, let's say, a dummy agent, the Lola is far, far superior just because it knows how to influence the other agent. And the same goes for MADPG. When, for example, such a clever agent interacts with, let's say, a DQN, which is a knife agent, an MATPG can very easily find a way to manipulate DQN in some way, of course. Um, so, but just to make it clear, this is very, very novel. And we are far away from deploying it. Let's say the big problem is that we can deploy it in, let's say, for example, robot swarms or autonomous driving. But there are a few challenges which I would love to, let's say, just mentioned to you, which are non-stationarity, open multi-agent systems, credit assignment, and many, many other. 
In short, what it says, all these challenges that we still do badly when it comes to finding a way to quickly adapt to new problems, to new challenges. And we need to find a way to do it in a better way. Uh, however, the promise is, of course, huge. And if we are able to solve it, not only we could deploy it, but also we could actually use it to understand ourselves better. And this, I think, is something which I'm personally very excited about, as how, how we could simulate it and how we could draw conclusions to learn more about ourselves. Thank you.